Now this time of September, October is the time of the year when uh, Jewish people celebrate what they call the Autumn Feasts. For them in the Northern Hemisphere it's autumn, for us it's uh, heading into summer. And they celebrate during the month of Tishrei, which means in Hebrew, New Beginning, three autumn feasts, Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which is not a feast but a fast, so rather, shall we say, three autumn holy days or holidays, and again, by holidays, we don't mean eating, drinking, and being merry, but um, <clears throat> recommitting oneself to the Lord God. So, uh, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, these are the latter year feasts. The Spring feasts are Pesach, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or, and then the Feast of Weeks, which we know as Pentecost. These feasts, these holidays, these holy days, these fasting days, some of them, were given by God to the Jewish people for very specific purposes. So if you turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23, we're going to learn about some of those purposes. And as we look at verse 1, we'll commit this reading to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being here amongst us this morning. We thank you for your presence, your glory, your eternal and infinite love, your unassailable truth for the creation around us and for all your gifts and blessings and mercies on us. We may think we have troubles, but compared to most in the world, we have none. And we thank you for what we've, you've done for us. We thank you for what you will continue to do for us. And we thank you this morning for the power of your Holy Spirit who teaches us the glory of your word. And we pray that this learning, this teaching, and hopefully the living that will follow will bring glory to your precious name, the one and only Savior from sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're told in Leviticus chapter 3 verse 1 that the Lord spoke to Moses, meaning Jesus spoke to Moses, the word of the Lord, the Devar, the Logos, Jesus in print or in voice spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the feasts of the Lord... So not your feasts, Moses, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Now a convocation is not just a meeting. It's a very specific word in Hebrew, and it means a gathering a solemn gathering by God for a very solemn and holy and vital purpose. And it gives a picture of God gathering His people so that He can talk to them and they can respond in worship to Him. And they are His feasts. And the Hebrew word is Hatekofat Adonai, the appointed times of the Lord. 
They are very special events and times. And that term, Hatekofat, means that they were appointed, created, written down, devised in heaven. Not here on earth, not in the creation we see, but in heaven for us here on earth. They are heavenly, divinely appointed times of God. The other reason that God gave these times to his people is that they give his people an agricultural calendar. Almost every civilization at that time ran on an agricultural economy and was dependent for survival on the success of that agricultural economy. And God's appointed times, appointed feasts, punctuated that agricultural calendar for his people. And if they followed that calendar and did their agricultural work according to his guidance, they would stand the best chance possible of success, prosperity, non-starvation. But there was much more to it than that, because each feast, each holiday, was a specific form of worship to the one true God. It was always the same God, but each holiday had its special attributes. And so God was teaching his people that whatever goodness they received, whatever blessings uh, they received from their agricultural work were from him. And they were not to boast in their own cleverness and prowess, but to thank and worship him for his blessings, his mercies, his goodness to him. And whatever produce came through were to, was to be a source of worship a kernel of worship, a unit of worship to the one true God. Not, gee whiz, look how good a farmer I am. No, look how God has blessed me and how successful he's allowed me to be when I obey him. But then very importantly, perhaps for us the most important these holy days, these holidays, refer to what theologians call Heil's Geschichte, salvation history. And each holiday is fulfilled by Jesus at certain points and times throughout the history of his salvation of mankind from mankind's sin. And when he comes again the second time, he will have fulfilled all the prophecies contained in all the feasts, the spring and the autumn. When he came the first time, and when he sent his Holy Spirit after he left the first time, he fulfilled the spring holiday prophecies. He has partly fulfilled the autumn holiday prophecies, but he is still to complete the fulfillment of those when he comes the second time. So the autumn feasts point very powerfully towards Jesus' second coming. Therefore, reading about the autumn feasts, learning about the autumn feasts, helps us to prepare ourselves to be ready for his second coming and helps us to teach, disciple others 
to be ready for his second coming. And that's what we're going to do a little bit of this morning. The spring feasts led up to the first harvest, which took place just before the Feast of Weeks. The Hebrew term is Hag Shavuot. We call it Pentecost. And the harvest was mainly grain, wheat and barley, which was used, of course, to make various types of breads and the barley to make certain fermented drinks, which point towards the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in the teaching and living of the Word of God. And when Jesus came, He is and was the Word incarnate. So the grain harvest taught about Him being there as the Word. And the Word is what brings life to the dead, the gospel of Jesus. And with that spring time at the harvest, there is what's called the former day rains. There are good rains in the early months of the Hebrew calendar. Then there's this long, hot summer. We have a little bit of rain here, a little bit of rain there, but not that much. And in Heil's Geschichte, this refers to the time of the Gentiles when God's favor was concentrated on the growing Gentile church initially because of rebellion by the Jewish nation. In the last days, to which the autumn feasts powerfully point, God's favor starts to shift back to the Jewish nation. And you have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Jewish people. He never ever leaves the hearts of Gentile believers, but the Gentile nations, as they become more and more sickeningly apostate, lose a lot of God's favor because of their growing unprecedented levels of sin and rebellion. And he starts to shift back towards the Jewish people where the final fulfillment will take place. And the second harvest, which is thanked for at tabernacles, is a harvest of fruit. There's a bit of fruit at the spring harvest and there's a bit of grain at the autumn harvest, but mainly the autumn harvest is fruit. Now, if we're to be ready for Jesus' second coming, we have to be bearing fruit. Jesus says, you will know them, those who are true believers, how? By how loud they talk, by how well they dance, by what they say. No, by their fruit you shall know them. If we are not bearing fruit using the gifts that Jesus Christ has given to us through the Holy Spirit to all those who are followers of Him, no one is an exception, no one is without gifts, and if we're not bearing fruit, then we're not going to be ready for His second coming. We have to be bearing fruit the Bible says many times Jesus will come and judge mankind according to his deeds. Not according to his words, according to his deeds. You are not saved by your deeds and works, but your deeds tell God and others whether you really believe in and believe the words of Jesus or whether it's all this and just two hours attendance on a Sunday morning and nothing else. If you really believe in Him, and you really love Him, then you will live according to that belief. Not perfect lives, of course, we all make mistakes. But we will be judged according to our deeds, which will tell whether we really have faith, 
which saves us, or whether us saying we have faith was just a lie all along. So we need to be ready for Jesus' second coming. And I believe that looking at these three holidays will help us to prepare to be ready and help us to help others to be ready. So now let's, let's look at verse 23 of Leviticus 23. The first of the autumn holidays, the first of the autumn feasts, which all took place all in the same month, Tishrai, which means new beginning. Now, the Feast of Trumpets today is called by Jewish rabbis who don't believe in Jesus, Rosh Hashanah, the top of the year. And they call it the Happy New Year, the first day of the new year in the Jewish calendar. That is not how it was in God's decree. The first month of God's year was a month of Abib, which is the month in which Passover took place. By the way, the other reason God gave the Jewish people this very specific agricultural calendar was so that if they followed it, they would be shown to be separated from and different to the other pagan nations around them who also followed their own pagan religion-based agricultural calendars. And we are called to be different from and separated from the world. So, verse 23, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, Tishrei, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, or a solemn rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. So it means you don't work for yourself. You work only for God on that day. You don't go home and sleep for 24 hours. You get off your bottom and work for Him. But you don't work for yourself. You work for Him. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So on that day, they were gathered together to meet with God, to hear from God, to worship God. And the leaders of the people, the priests and the elders, blew trumpets. Now this is not Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. This is the ram's horn, the shofar. There were little silver trumpets that were blown at other times in the Jewish calendar, but this is not them. These are the ram's horns. And the Hebrew word is shafar, plural shafrim, and it's the same word for judges, the book of judges. The book of judges is sefer shafrim. And these ram's horns blowings were for very specific purposes. It was not to go and enjoy a musical evening under the Israeli sunset. That was not the point, although that was a nice side blessing that God could give. So why were these ram's horns blown? What does the blowing of a horn mean? Turn to Joel chapter 2 and we'll learn that. In verse 1 of Joel, chapter 2. Joel is after Hosea, which is after Daniel, which is after Ezekiel. I hope I've got that right. Joel, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet, a shofar, in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. It's an alarm. There's a problem. Things are not altogether lacquer. 
blow an alarm and where in Zion on my holy mountain where does judgment begin not in New York not in the brothels not in the drug running uh, houses not in the world in the house of God the warning has to start within the church that if the church is not made aware of what's coming if the church does not make the world aware of what's coming then nobody's going to be aware the awareness the wake up has to start in here it's not going to happen out there if it doesn't start in here so blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble not happy new year let's blow a bleep and get wrecked no wrong tremble you hear the shofar you tremble for the day of the lord is coming for it is at hand a day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness like the morning clouds spread over the mountains god's judgment is coming it's coming on the false church and then and then it's coming on the world and tribulation the like of which the world has never seen is coming it's not happy new year all is well all is not well turn to chapter uh, verse 12 of the same chapter now therefore says the lord turn to me with all your heart with fasting and with weeping not giggling and laughing and with mourning so rend your heart and not your garments it's not an outward show the repentance must be from within and that's what this trumpet blast is doing it's calling people to repent and the start of the repentance has to happen in the church no revival in god's people ever began with giggling and laughing and falling on the floor none the only true revivals that have ever occurred all began with weeping and mourning and true repentance return to the lord your god for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and he relents from doing harm who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him a grain offering and a drink offering for the lord your god note what the blessing is more word more power of the holy spirit not more us dollars not a better rate we all need to pray for those things because it's not right that people are distressed and anguished as they are it's good to pray for material prosperity for other people and trust in god to look after ourselves but the main blessing is his word and the power of the holy spirit not material wealth that's the blessing to which we look forward when we repent the living word of god in our churches in our personal lives in our families in our businesses blow the trumpet in zion consecrate a fast call a sacred assembly gather the people sanctify the congregation assemble the elders the elders need assembling by the way they're sitting at home sleeping gather the children and nursing babes no excuses oh, i got a baby at home get yourself here now let the bridegroom grow out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room oh we're a little busy drop it drop it there's something more important oh we're going on honeymoon not now my son in here 
Let the priests who ministered to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage reproach that the nations rule over them. Why should they say among the people, Where is their God? So the trumpets are calling people to repent. Now, what is that repentance? That repentance is spoken about in the next holiday, the Day of Atonement. So back to Leviticus 23. And in verse 28 we read, Still in the same month, Tishrai, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month, shall be the day of atonement. You can think of atonement as a word play, at one month. Because of Jesus' atonement on the cross for our sin, if we repent, then we are now at one with him. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls. How do you repent? You literally torment yourself for the sins you have committed. You are grieved for the sins you have committed. And you shall do no work, none at all. You shall just be on your knees and beg God for his forgiveness. That's all. Nothing else is required. No dancing in the aisles, no pretending this or that, certainly no going out and doing your own work, on our knees begging him to forgive us of our sins. Not the government's sins, not the New Yorker's sins, not the drug runners and the whatever sins, our sins. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. Anyone who is not prepared to do this will not be ready for Jesus' second coming and will not be included in the kingdom. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from amongst his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever through your generations, in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening. During holidays, holy days, the Hebrew edict was all lehoshek, light to dark. The days started at sunset and ended at the next sunset. It's always the case in the Hebrew calendar, but especially so on holy days. And you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Now, we are not called on to go and ritually celebrate the Day of Atonement the way the Jewish people did, but the spiritual meaning is there forever and ever, and it applies to us as much as it applied here when this book was written. Repent. Now, turn back a little bit to Leviticus 16, and we're just going to read a little bit. You're going to have to bear with me about what the priest actually did on that day for you to understand what is asked, what Jesus is expecting of those whom he has saved. So Leviticus 16, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Now, the curtain has been opened by the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can now meet with him face to face and have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship forever and ever. And in fact, that is salvation. And if we're not doing that, we're not saved. If we are saved, 
we have that relationship. But what we mustn't do is not having repented, not having accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, not having acknowledged the blood of the Lamb as cleansing us from all sin, i.e. we haven't got to that point yet, pretend that we are Christians. And there are pretenders in all churches, and some of them get quite high up in the ministry hierarchy as well. And it says in Galatians, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And it's talking about those who pretend to be believers, but are not. For you shall die. Now, this is what the priest had to do. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull. So he was only able to get into that holy place with blood. We can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus every second of every minute of every hour of our lives because of His blood. But we have to have come to that point where we have repented and put our faith and trust in Him. With the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. And he shall put on the holy linen tunic and the holy trousers on his body. And he shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turb, uh, turban he shall be attired. These were the garments of salvation worn by the priest. And they covered the flesh. And when we are saved by Jesus, we are given garments of salvation. We're told this in Isaiah which covers our flesh so that when people see us living in the world, they don't see the old, fleshly, sinful person. They see Jesus reflected in the garments of salvation. Those garments of salvation, the linen, we're told in Revelation, it's the works we do for Jesus because we are saved by our faith in him. So if we're not doing anything for him, and that almost always means doing things for other people in his name, sacrificing ourselves, if we're not doing that, then we're not wearing the linen garments. We are wandering around naked. And the priest to come face to face with Jesus had to be wearing the linen. We have to be wearing the linen. In other words, we must be doing the works he calls each and every one of us to do. Not the works we decide we want to do, the works he wants us to do, whether we like them or not. Verse 5, And he shall take from the congregation the, uh, of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering, and one ram as a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and make atonement for himself and his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and one lot for the scapegoat. The Hebrew word is she'er azazel. It's a very specific term. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. So, there would be these two goats for one sin offering. Two goats, one sin offering. One would be slaughtered in the holy place and the blood taken into the Holy of Holies. The other, all the sins of all the priests and all the people would be ceremonially put on its head. The high priest would hold its head while this was happening, and then it would be taken into the desert and released into the wilderness, the sins being taken away into a place of forgetfulness. Jesus says, I choose not to remember your sins if you come to me in faith. The goat gets forgotten. Now why goats? At Passover, they sacrificed a lamb. 
Why hear goats and why two? The lamb refers to, the sacrifice of the lamb refers to the need to forgive the sins of those who have not known the Lord, who are in complete rebellion and who need salvation. But these feasts are more pertinent to the church, people who do know Jesus. And despite our salvation, we still sin. And we still need to repent. And we still need to come back to the foot of the cross. Jesus doesn't need to die again. That was once and sufficient for all. But we have to re-acknowledge in our hearts and minds what he did for us. And that's what the goat uh, is for. Also, there are two goats for two reasons. Why? Sin as a believer is more serious in God's eyes than sin from non-believers. Sin in the church is far more painful and hurtful to God than sin from people who don't even know Him. Also, there are two forms of sin. There is the sin of commission. We know blinking well it's wrong, but we, we're going to enjoy the next 10 minutes and we're going to do it anyway. And there are sins of omission. Well, I really should do that, but uh, I haven't got time and I'm too busy, so I won't. So two goats. Now verse 11, And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself in his house. Kill the bull as a sin offering which is for himself. And he shall take the censer full of burning coals, fire from the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, and bring it inside the veil, and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of incense goes over the mercy seat. So you pray. Incense is the prayer of the saints. You come in prayer and supplication on your knees before an eternal sovereign God. Lord Jesus, despite the fact that you have saved me, I am an idiot and I have sinned. I have committed sins of commission and I have committed sins of omission. Please forgive me. Please remind me. Please reassure me of the power of the blood and the blessings of your Holy Spirit. And he does. Like that. And the scapegoat goes off into the desert and nobody sees it again. Heaven alone knows what happened to the poor beast, but I've never looked into that. And he does, but we've got to do that if we're going to be ready for a second coming. And if we think, ah, oh, I'm a Christian and I go to church and I pay my tithes and I'm and I don't need to repent, then we are not going to be ready for a second coming. If repentance doesn't start in here, it's not going to happen out there. Now, verse... can't read this. 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, do with that blood what he did with the blood of the bull. They sprinkled it in a very specific way. And verse 16, he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions. So the priest had to atone for the temple, for the tabernacle. Why? Not because the temple or tabernacle was somehow evil or wrong or tainted physically, but because those who ministered in it were and are in the church imperfect hu human beings who sin, who make mistakes. It's not a judgment. We all do it. None of us are perfect. So what we are called to do as priests of the new covenant, which every believer is a priest of the new covenant, is to constantly re-examine our work for the Lord in the light of the blood of the Lamb. 
Are we, in our ministries, starting to get terribly proud and self-righteous? Are we getting arrogant? Are we getting bolshy and argumentative? Are we getting dictatorial? Are we turning our ministries into an idol to boost our own selves and our popularity with a congregation? Or are we truly working in that ministry to bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to bring those who know him to a stronger relationship with him and those who don't know him to a saving knowledge of him. We have to be constantly re-examining ourselves as priests of the new covenant. And we have to go back to the blood of the Lamb, the word of God, go back to the Holy Spirit and ask him to show us where we've gone wrong. And where we have gone wrong, we ask for Jesus' forgiveness and bringing us back to the right path. And he is always faithful to unconditionally, without any prejudice, do just that. But that must be our constant attitude as priests of the new covenant. And in your own time, you can read the rest of Leviticus chapter 16. It's pretty heavy stuff, but it's amazing stuff. Now, let's go back to the last feast, verse in chapter 23 of Leviticus, verse 33, the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the one feast which Jesus has largely not yet fulfilled. The Feast of Tab Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, Sukkot, Hag Sukkot in Hebrew, refers very specifically to his second coming and his millennial rule on earth from the throne of David, which is going to happen. Don't let anyone try to teach you that it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. Those people who say there won't be a literal rule on earth by the Lord Jesus Christ are going to get an awful shock when CNN shows this picture one day of this king on the throne in Israel. And they're all going to say, who on earth is that? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, it shall be a feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. Again, you shall do no customary work. You won't work for yourself, but you will work for God. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and, a, and drink offerings, every, everything on its day. Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. So you don't stop doing what you must do day by day. This is more. This is extra. This is special because we are in the end days, because the times of the tribulation are coming, because Jesus' second coming is imminent. Because the times are so urgent, we have to be doing all of this, but we don't stop doing what we ordinarily have to do day by day for him as well. We don't go on seven years holiday and say, I'm only going to go to church now. I'm going to leave my job. No, you keep on doing your job for Jesus. You keep on looking after your family for Jesus. You keep on looking after your elderly parents or parents-in-law for Jesus. And you do this. You blow a trumpet in Zion. You repent. You examine yourself and your ministries. And you get ready for a second coming. 
Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, so we have to be bearing fruit. If we are not shown to be bearing fruit, we will, be not, we will not be part of this tabernacle. Get away from me, I never knew you. Ah, but we said this, so we, no, no, where's the fruit? So when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there'll be a Sabbath rest, on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord. Now this was the palms. Now the church has idiotically called this Palm Sunday and mistaken the meaning of what was happening on the palm, whatever day of the week it was, when people were waving palm leaves, Hebrew lulavim, when Jesus came in on the donkey. They knew that tabernacles represented the coming of the millennial rule of the Messiah. They wanted that millennial rule to start that day Jesus entered Jerusalem on the donkey. That's why they were waving the palm leaves. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed to the, is the name of the Lord. Welcome to the King of David. They wanted him to go in, kick out the Roman garrison, and set up the millennial messianic rule. And when he didn't, and started castigating them, and telling them that they needed to repent, they crucified him. So they got it wrong, and the church gets it wrong. But there will be a true tabernacle when he comes for his people, and we will rejoice, but we can rejoice now. We can show the joy of looking forward to that coming now. We can show the palm leaves and the branches in figure, in type, in our in, inner joy now. The world can be falling apart around, around us, but if we show the joy of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the knowledge of the coming of Jesus to others, we can show them tabernacles now. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seven months. Verse 42, you shall dwell in booths for seven days. And what Jewish people had to do, and the Orthodox ones still do, is they would build bowers of these branch leaves and live in them for seven days. Eat in them, cook in them, sleep in them for seven days. Obviously, no one's expecting us to go and do that. You can do it for fun if you want. I'm not going to do it. But the spirit behind it you must do. What is the spirit? Don't trust in this world. You've got a huge big house or you live in a little hovel. It doesn't matter. When Jesus comes back, we're all going to be living in his glory. Don't trust in this world. The material benefits, in inverted commas, of this life are irrelevant. If you live to 120 or you live till 20, all that counts is that you've died trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't trust in this world. Because he is coming back. And this world is going to be judged in a way it cannot even begin to imagine. And believe me, you don't want to be on the wrong side of that. Now, to finish off, turn to Numbers 29. Now, when you look at Numbers 29, you'll see it's terribly long, and you'll get a fright. And don't worry, I'm not going through the whole of Numbers 29. I'm just going to start. Now, at the Feast of Trumpets, and on the Day of Atonement, what the priests had to offer and what each individual person had to offer were similar but different. Now at the Feast of Trumpets and at the Day of Atonement, 
Each person had to bring a burnt offering. Look at verse 2 of Numbers 29. A young bull, one bull, one ram, and seven lambs in their first year without blemish. Every single sacrificial animal points to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Every single one. But with that had to come a grain offering of fine flour. And actually the Hebrew word is the finest flour. The grain refers to the word. And the finest flour means no blemishes, no pollutants, no contaminants. It had to be absolutely pure. The doctrine, the teaching, the word of God, adherence must be absolutely pure. No false doctrine. No man-made, pride-driven rubbish. Pure Bible pure scripture and you have to have the word of God people who say oh, we could have church services just with singing and no word of God wrong if you don't love the word of the Savior then you don't love the Savior you can't love Jesus without loving his word and Jesus says those who love me are those who obey my word. This. Not some imagined instruction from the air. Here. So you had to have the grain. And it had to be mixed with oil, which is the Holy Spirit in anointing. And there had to be a drink offering, which is the Holy Spirit in worship. So you have to have the cross taught by the Word of God and that teaching empowered by the Holy Spirit. You have to have that. So that was for trumpets and that was for atonement. But on tabernacles, which looks forward to Jesus' second coming, it was different. Look at this in verse 12. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. You shall keep a feast to the Lord seven days. You shall present a burnt offering, an offering made by fire as a sweet aroma to the Lord. Thirteen young bulls, goodness me, two rams and fourteen lambs in their first year. And then as each day went by, the number of bulls dropped by one until you got down to seven. And then on the eighth day, one bull. And if you add up all the bulls, it comes to 70 bulls. And this word 70 in Hebrew is a very specific number and term. And I could go into the details and derivations, but I won't now. But just suffice to tell you that it means eternity. That's what 70 means. Eternity. Forever and ever. When Jesus comes back, it's forever and ever. No more pain, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more death. Forever and ever. And there are two rams and 14 lambs. We get a double portion of the blessings when he comes back. We get untold blessings every day of our lives here and most of us are thoroughly unappreciative because we're so worried about how we're going to spend the next three hours in a petrol queue or whatever but when he comes back we're going to get a double portion of all those blessings that's what's coming now on the eighth day after tabernacles they had a feast called Simchat Torah, joy in the Torah. And they would literally dance with joy. It was the only day of the year in which the scrolls could come out of the holy place and the yeshiva boys and the priests would hold their scrolls and dance in the streets near the temple or near the tabernacle. And it was known as the time of new beginnings. And it would punctuate an end to the reading 
of the whole of Scripture. They would come to the end of the Jewish Bible. And the next day they would start again in Brejit, Genesis, which is the Hebrew word for beginning. So it's new beginnings. The church has been called on to repent. Every believer is being called on to repent of his or her sins, which we all commit despite knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Contrary to what we may think, those sins are more serious and more hurtful to God than the sins we committed before we knew Him as our Lord and Savior. But they are every bit as forgivable if we do genuinely repent. But it's got to be genuine. We don't have to perform the ritual acts of the Day of Atonement. We don't have to go out and buy a ram's horn and blow it. Not actually a particularly pleasant sound, I have to tell you. It's not meant to be. It's meant to waken everyone up out of their stupor, and believe me, it does. The cardiac units are quite busy after the Day of Shofar blowing in Israel. We're not, we don't have to go and do that, but we have to take on board and enact the spiritual meeting. We've got to warn each other, warn ourselves, warn the church that God's judgment is coming, that the world is worsening by the day, that salvation is ever more desperately needed by ever more people. We've got to get out there and spread that gospel through what we say and what we do. We've got to work for the Lord. You can read back in that um, passage of Leviticus 23, no, sorry, Deuteronomy 16. Read that about tabernacles. And it says, God will bless you on the day of tabernacles through the work of your hands. What you've done for Jesus will be the way he blesses you and the mode of blessing of you from him. We've got to get out there and work for him because he's coming back and only those who are ready are going to be rejoicing with the palm leaves on the day of tabernacles. If you're not sure that tabernacles means the second coming of Jesus, read Zechariah 14 from verse 16 onwards. It makes it very clear. It is unbreakably bound to the coming and millennial rule of the one true Messiah. And it's not far away. Let's bow in a word of closing prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all your promises in your wonderful word, your blessed word, your eternal word, which are always faithfully fulfilled and never in any way reneged upon. And we are never disappointed. We can utterly rely on what you've promised to do for and give to your church. We pray, Lord, that you would make us truly appreciative of who you are, of what you are, and of all that you do for us and continue to do for us. We pray for the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, that we, we may live repentant lives, that we may live lives that are committed to work for you, both in our day-to-day -day work and also in our work specially committed to the spread of your gospel, the discipleship of believers, and the evangelism of non-believers. We pray for your church in this country, that it would show your love 